In Act One of Shakespeare's Hamlet, Polonius counsels his son Laertes before he embarks on his visit to Paris, saying, Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend. And if you've been a fixed income investor this year, you're nursing your wounds and you might have wished you heeded his advice. At a global level, we've seen over a decade of nominal bond returns wiped out for the first time since the early 1950s. So it seems a good time to talk about fixed income. An asset's return is typically a function of the price you pay for it. And this is an asset class that has become much cheaper as yields raised higher. And given we're in October today, the question might be trick or treat. And to help us guide us through this topic, I'm delighted to welcome Greg Peters, Managing Director and Co-Chief Investment Officer of PGM Fixed Income. Greg, welcome to the Money Miss podcast. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to uh, join your podcast. I have to say, uh, I've become an avid listener uh, and uh, honored to be here as a result. Craig, there are some big beasts in the world of fixed income, and PGIM, with $790 billion in assets under management for fixed income, is one of them. Craig, you and I overlapped at Morgan Stanley, although we never met, and you were Global Director of Fixed Income and Economic Research and Chief Global Cross Asset Strategist and responsible for the firm's macro research and asset allocation. And we can have, and we will have, I think, quite a lot to talk about today. And I've had the opportunity to listen and study some of your work as I did my research. And I hope today we can begin with your work, which goes back a few months on why the 60-40 portfolio is flawed, although not for the obvious reasons of the low yields we had at the time and your view that it needs to be reassessed, then we can move on to whether the bond market has got its teeth back, what to do with fixed income and where to do it from governments to EM and credit and quite a few more things, if that's okay with you. <laughs> so let's, let's retrace a few decades, if I may. What shaped you most growing up? Failure, I think, actually, now I think about it. Uh, I wasn't prepared for that question, Simon. Uh, but uh, uh, but I think about things that uh, I've just uh, failed uh, repeatedly at, expectations that, uh, you know, weren't met. Lots of, lots of it, uh, out, you know, has to do with uh, um, uh, sports and athletics, of course, which, you know, at the end of the day, doesn't matter, but it's a great training ground uh, uh, for failure. And so, yeah, I, I would, I think I've always been driven by uh, uh, my failures and then consequently the fear of uh, failure in the future. So um, I know it's a dark, dark answer, but perhaps that's why I landed in the field of fixed income. <laughs> well, I think equity guys like a story and bond guys often like the numbers, which is why I definitely ended up in the equity side. Um, but that's okay because we have a lot of people who give great advice and I think others listen to this podcast and may think all these people have, you know, assumed and arrived at such great positions, but that belies the fact their journeys might have been troubled, difficult and littered with setbacks. So thank you for your candor. Um, I think your first grown up job was in the US Treasury. How did that come about? It was. It was a fantastic job. So it was on the heels of the savings and loans loan crisis uh, uh, here in the U.S., which, um, you know, was a, a byproduct of uh, too easy lending, deregulation, real estate, uh, you know, uh, going out of control uh, uh, and, uh, and then fraud kind of uh, sprinkled in as well. So um, I was a, a bank regulator, bank examiner. Um, and uh, man, it was such a great training ground. I learned so much at such a young age. I um, I had so much responsibility at a very young age, um, and I'm so grateful for that. Uh, I uh, I feel fortunate to be part of that. And I think working for the Treasury, working for the government, um, is a tremendous, tremendous experience. Uh, more often than not. And how did you? either fall or leap from there into the world of bonds? Well, so I, uh, you know, since it was such a great training ground and, and, and so much was happening, uh, 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 you know, that provided all this opportunity and understanding of these different financial products. Uh, and then quite frankly, Simon, 
overregulation kicked in and the job became somewhat tedious to me. So um, it, it was a little too rote and a little too, you know, same old, same old. So, so I used that as an opportunity to make a career move and shift to, uh, uh, shift to Wall Street. And that's what I did. And that was Solomon Brothers, yeah? It was. It was on the mortgage side. So um, uh, on the mortgage derivative and mortgage-backed security side. And I think that was really instrumental as I thought about the glo global financial crisis as so many of those instruments that I was involved in um, on the mortgage side ceased to exist. And I was thinking, gosh, that's the same pattern I'm seeing today in the credit markets. And so when innovation is nothing more than additional spread and complexity for complexity's sake, uh, that's typically a red flag. And so having that experience on the mortgage side actually allowed me to, uh, I think, see the, the, uh, the gloom and doom, maybe not as gloomy and doomy as it panned out to be, but the concerns uh, in the credit market. The mortgage desk at Salomon Brothers. Well, of course, we can't let that go without saying that we were lucky enough to have Michael Lewis on the show, who sat on that very desk um, and, and authored Liars Poker and uh, what stories um, came from that. Let's talk about today. I think it was Jim Reed at Deutsche Bank who said that even in the entire decade of high inflation and bond losses of the 1970s, at no point did we see a global bond bear market. And what helped was the coupons, which averaged, I think, over 7%. So we're going to dig into the landscape. But let's just start with this 60-40, because the 60-40 has been etched into allocators thinking institutional and individual 60 equity, 40 fixed income. There have been variations, but it's been as close as you get to religion when we think about asset allocation. And you wrote a very interesting piece a while ago when yields were where they were a few months ago, saying, and I'll quote you, while we acknowledge that the 60-40 construct is overdue for an overhaul, it's not due to low bond yields. So I'd love to hear why you think and have thought that. Yeah, so if you think about the 60-40, it, it's somewhat of a randomly contrived portfolio construction uh, allocation, right? Um, and so the whole idea behind it is that bonds would balance out equities, um, it's, it was kind of like the precursor to risk parity in many different ways, you know. Um, um, uh, and so um, we were getting so many questions uh, back, you know, a year and a half ago, nine months ago, two years ago. You know, why why do I need to have bonds in a portfolio? That was be, that uh, that was the question asked. And quite frankly, it was a great question, right? And in retrospect, it was the absolute perfect question. Um, uh, and so, you know, we attacked the, um, the, uh, the question in a very different way. We were thinking about it very analytically. Uh, um, uh, and what is the bond portfolio piece of the 6040 uh, hoping to achieve? And just to overly simplify, uh, it is about providing solutions to the ro retirees. And so uh, you, with a long long kind of stated cash flow need out the curve, like most retirees, you know, need and desire, you should be less focused on the near-term volatility. And some of those near-term volatility measures are the ones that kind of force you into 60-40 um, or more equities than, you know, bonds and alike. And we were like, let's think about it from a cash flow, longer term solution-based need. And we we just determined that actually you're better off having more bonds in your portfolio, not less. Now you can cynically say, of course, you're going to say that, Greg, because we're an active fixed income manager. Uh, but, but it's about thinking about those cash flows out the curve uh, more than the near-term focus on what the vol markets uh, or, or what's happening in the market today. So that that's kind of the the uh, the simple answer. I will say, Simon, though, that the world has changed since we wrote that paper. I mean, uh, negative yielding debt has just uh, absolutely shrunk, you know, from over 18 trillion to less than two trillion. The loan holdout uh, uh, is Japan. So Japan is the only jurisdiction now with negative uh, yielding debt. I think other countries and sovereigns and central banks look at that and they 
they're thankful that they're not in that position anymore. You know, bond yields obviously has increased pretty substantially globally. Uh, so I think the 60-40 construct that was so much in question nine months ago, a year ago, uh, 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 is no longer being questioned. And so I think we're on the uh, precipice of era of kind of revenge of the bond market. Uh, uh, and so um, I see bonds uh, uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing on a go forward basis. Um, uh, and I'm kind of excited about the opportunity as a result, honestly. Well, I'm going to pause you uh, right there because we're going to talk about the current opportunity set. But I just, before we leave that 60-40, one of the things that you can explain to our audience, and I'm going to, again, I'm going to quote you from your report, which is you talked about the underappreciated role of duration in portfolio construction. And I think that's really helpful to understand. Yeah. So once again, the, the underappreciation duration is matching what your needs are out the curve. Um, uh, and so what I mean by that is uh, if you retire, if you're retiring 30 years from now, you should be less concerned about what's happening this year, next year, and the next five years, let's say, uh, and think about what are, what are your cash flow uh, needs 30 years from now what are uh, you know? What are you trying to solve for? Uh, and if you go through that and and then kind of run the analytics around that, the answer uh, is actually you need more duration, not less. And so having that exposure, that interest rate risk exposure. Keep in mind, duration is just interest rate risk exposure uh, measured in years. Uh, and so you want to air on the side of being longer duration, not shorter duration, because you're actually solving for that cash flow need 30 years from now, as an example, not over the next couple of years. So it's a longer term focus versus a shorter term focus. And when you take a longer term focus and through a longer term lens, duration, adding duration to a balanced portfolio is something that's actually uh, incredibly valuable. Got it. So now we can go back to what you were uh, embarking on, which is the revenge of the bond market. It was the renowned US political consultant, James Carville, who famously said, I used to think if there was reincarnation, I wanted to come back as the president or the pope, but now I want to come back as the bond market. You can intimidate everybody. And uh, Aidan McGreevy, who's a veteran of Goldman Sachs fixed income and a shrewd friend of the show said, the question for you is, has the bond market now got real political influence? I don't know. I, you know, the whole bond vigilante. Gosh, I wish that was true. Uh, you know, I don't feel like, uh, you know, us bond investors have any additional uh, political clout or any uh, power, that's for sure. Maybe on the margin we do. Uh, but, you know, I'm looking at a, a, a graph right now, actually, um, just uh, bond market, uh, uh, world bond market uh, index annual returns, right? Uh, uh, and so this year uh, is the fourth worst year on record. Uh, you have to go back to uh, uh, 1721 for the South Sea company bubble bursting, the end of the US Civil War, uh, uh, UK off the gold standard. So these these monumental historical moments and then you have 2022 right <laughs> so like you know so uh, you know i wonder how that's going to be labeled back uh, you know 50 years from now what this period is going to be labeled as uh, uh, as you have all these other historic type of years that have driven the bond market uh, uh, to such a severe decline so something has shifted simon right um and so you know, the bad news is that we've had to endure this repricing. Um, I actually think uh, as difficult as it's been, uh, I think we're in a much healthier place today than where we were uh, heading in. I often think about just the opportunity set, uh, uh, you know, in US market, uh, Europe uh, at all. And I'm looking at negative yields or zero yields and 
really what's the opportunity, right? Uh, and, and, and so that's why we were getting all those questions on the efficacy of 6040. But since that time, we've really repriced and you're starting at a much more favorable place. And the important part about fixed income is the income piece. And that is basically the yield and the carry. Uh, 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 and so we've seen a tremendous shift this year, historic by every measure. The fact that I'm quoting you know, 1721 uh, returns in the global bond market uh, suggests that it is historic. Um, and um, I think if you look at those periods uh, uh, subsequently, uh, they're pretty favorable. So I feel pretty good about the future. But before I l leave it or even let you go, I am I guess we look at the UK. There we had a swift punitive response to the political uh, decisions that have been made. And I know and I've read you think it's an isolated case, but when you go from a zero yielding world where you played a game and, and played fast and loose with the price of money, don't you think that there, there are a lot of accidents waiting to happen? I think there's that tendency. We're a much levered world. We're a much more levered society. Uh, I think not only have sovereigns, but corporates have been kind of hopped up on low interest rates, right? So it's allowed these, these uh, institutions to uh, add more leverage. And I think you know, more leverage means more volatility and more risk of financial ask, uh, accident. Uh, I think the UK situation is isolated um, and a cautionary tale at the same time. And so if you look at the, the swift action meted out by the bond market and the currency market, uh, uh, that should be a cautionary tale for other countries. Um, and so the price action makes perfect sense to me. Uh, and Lord knows I don't want to uh, enter the political fray here, but if you just take take the mini budget uh, uh, at kind of surface value, uh, uh, it is something that just doesn't quite work if you're a bond investor and doesn't quite work from uh, an FX uh, investor. And those two markets reprice pretty substantially. Um, uh, and I think, um, uh, there was surprise that there was a repricing, uh, and I'm not sure why, as I think it was foretold by uh, um, other people within uh, 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 Parliament. So, yes, it's a cautionary tale. Bad policy will get uh, punished, and if that's being a vigilante, then so be it, as I think it makes perfect sense to me. I'm going to quote um, Chris Dale, who runs something called Kimbrey Capital, because in his recent report, he wrote, responses to the inflationary environment are likely to be fraught globally as central banks fear inflation and politicians fear recessions. And so they will be pulling in different directions. Absolutely. And that's somewhat intractable, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and honestly, I don't think we've even entered the intractable stage yet. So we're in this this uh, phase where growth is still holding on much better than I think many uh, envisioned. I know there's been some some uh, new numbers released, particularly out of the UK, that were slightly weaker, um, but still reasonably strong, just given the the uh, circumstances uh, uh, surrounding the economies, higher rates uh, uh, at all, um, but. You know, what I worry about, Simon, next year is the environment where inflation remains, you know, sticky, higher than uh, anticipated, uh, and then growth really starts to uh, fall down. You really put central banks uh, in quite a predicament. Um, and uh, there's a huge debate, obviously, in the marketplace about that. But um, I, I'm on the side of are central banks going to so easily give up 40 years of inflation fighting credibility uh, 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 in that environment? And I think the answer is no. And what I think, if you're left with those kind of bad options, I think they're going to choose a one of uh, slowing down growth even more in order to deal with inflation, which isn't such a great outcome necessarily. Yes. I, I mean, I've been a big 
worry about inflation and critic of central banks. Uh, but I just sort of find myself checking, checking myself because some of these forward-looking indicators on inflation do suggest that particularly when we have the better comparisons, the numbers get better. We've got this decline in lots of input prices going on in the commodity space. That ISM New Orders Index last week was very weak. And we've got, what, $95 billion of tightening through QT going on each month. What would be the surprise here that the Fed is done sooner than the market's now thinking? I think the, the surprise is the opposite. Uh, okay. Investors have been fighting this the entire way. I think Hope Springs Eternal, uh, the, uh, the U.S. market in particular, have really fought against the Fed's rhetoric. You know, if you go back to Jackson Hole, that's when uh, Powell and Co. really started to amp up like, we have to take rates higher. Oh, and by the way, they're going to remain higher. So if you looked at what was pricing the marketplace, I think it was really confounding the Fed, which was you, uh, you had rates escalating um, into uh, year end 2022 and then dipping in 2023, basically cutting again. And the, the, the Fed and other central bankers really felt that was doing you know, their job a disservice in trying to fight inflation, right? If it's just a temporary uh, uh, move, then will you be able to, through rate policy, deal with inflation? I think uh, they decided the answer is no. So as a consequence of that, um, they, they worked hard to, to tell the market that rates are not only going to uh, go higher, but they're going to stay higher. And I think that's important from a policy standpoint, but I still don't believe the market uh, is biting down on it. So that's why I think the risk is that actually continuing um, uh, uh, or going even higher than that. So uh, you have this plateauing uh, late this year, early next year. And if that doesn't prove to be the case, um, I think uh, uh, that is not going to be a great outcome for markets, particularly given the fact that I think investors have been leaning the other way the entire time. Okay, well, that's well put. I accept that. But let's talk about the sort of the the world of allocators and you're advising them and you're managing, you know, a large pools of capital. Rates have gone up. There's expectation of further increases. What are you wanting to do? Should we just start with government bonds, first of all, and then we can go down the or up the risk curve? So, so the repricing has been predominantly in government bond space. When we're talking about higher yields, we're really talking about the fact that sovereign bond markets have repriced, right? So we think about the world uh, and we separate the risks uh, through duration risks uh, uh, and spread and credit risk. Um, and the duration risk side, the government bond market side has repriced, absolutely. Uh, and so you've seen, you know, you have uh, gilts now you know, as we're talking, you know, 5% type of levels, you have U.S. Treasuries, 4% type of levels. This is a, a wholesale change. So the risk-free uh, environment, and I'm doing air quotes here, the risk-free environment uh, has, has repriced in a meaningful way. I think that's where the opportunity is as we're looking forward over the near term. So I see it very much as a sequencing. So rate hikes continue globally. There's a, a highly coordinated effort by central bankers to bring inflation down. Uh, that means higher rates and the, those rates have already moved, I would submit, or largely moved. So I think that is large, mostly over. Uh, but then those rates start to bite down on the economy. Let's just say throws the economy, the global economy, into a recession. The best line of defense in that type of environment uh, uh, is owning sovereign bonds. So I think you want to move your allocation into sovereign bonds first. And once that starts to get traction, then you want to move into more risk assets, whether it's uh, high yield bonds, levered loans, equities and alike. So to me, it's a, uh, it's a pattern sequencing of asset allocation. But 
What has moved the most in the marketplace have been uh, the more liquid parts of the market, the sovereign bond markets, uh, and some of the less risky uh, assets and fixed income. So to me, the catch-up trade here over the next, call it three months or so, is the more cyclical, the more levered parts of the markets are exposed vis-a-vis the more safe parts of the market. Yeah, well, having not bought a government bond for, I think, a decade, I bought some short data gilts the other day, a little bit early, but uh, but I get that. Let's just talk about corporate credit, because as we've seen, probably most recently in the 08, 09 GFC, is that credit can behave much more like equity in troubled times. And you've spoken a bit about the leverage in the system. We're all aware of, you know, the cheap money that has allowed corporates to, to feed greedily at the trough of capital. Um, how how dislocated might we might we expect credit to come in that recessionary environment you're discussing? I don't know if it's dislocated as much as it is following its natural course. And so if you think about the past several cycles in credit, there really hasn't been a cycle, right? So central banks have come and rescued uh, the, uh, the markets uh, quite, quite quickly and quite opportunistically. If inflation is in fact the goal, uh, fighting inflation is in fact the goal, then I don't think central banks will have the same capacity or willingness to step into the fray uh, 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 in the credit markets. So it's important to remember that in 2000, March of 2020, uh, the Fed, for the first time ever, was buying credit, right? Uh, uh, you know, IG credit, and quite frankly, there were some double B, so high yield credit as well, as a way to to uh, get the markets moving. I don't know if they'll be able to do that this time around. So what does that mean? What that means to me is that you will have a more natural credit cycle where companies that are over levered, uh, uh, there's excess capacity for sure, given the fact that you know so many segments of the economies have been rescued throughout the years. And so I expect to see much more pressure uh, from a credit perspective, I see defaults coming in a little higher than being forecasted. Um, uh, and I see this natural credit cycle that we haven't seen in quite some time. As corporates have really benefited from this low cost debt environment. Um, so they've added a tremendous amount of debt on the books at a low cost. That's the good news. Uh, that has led to, particularly here in the US, uh, a much more profitable companies. You have a tremendous amount of operating leverage built into these capital structures. Uh, but the reverse is also true. Uh, 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 and so when those revenues start to decline, that high stock of debt starts to really weigh on those structures. Um, and uh, that could be a catalyst to you know much more pain and suffering on the credit side. So I think the credit side has a uh, some more room to go, so to speak, Simon. Yeah, well, that's well explained. I know that's been one of your specialities over the years, so thank you. Emerging market debt by the dollar or local currency has, again, not been on lots of asset allocators' minds, and certainly I sit you know, on an asset allocation committee and uh, we know it hasn't just hasn't been discussed. Should we, and are you looking anywhere in the world of emerging market debts for, uh, you know, for reasonable returns? EM has been, um, you know, a very difficult place to invest over the, you know, past several years for sure. Um, uh, it's been the classic value trap trade, both on the equity and credit side, as uh, it's it's flashing uh, attractive and cheap, but it's cheap for a reason, as we say. Um, um, and so. Um, you've seen a lot of money move out of emerging markets. I think that presents an opportunity as well. And so the way I'm thinking about it from an emerging market standpoint is around inflation. So what has really caused a lot of disruption on the fixed income side is the fact that central banks in these emerging markets had to be much more aggressive than initially envisioned uh, uh, to fight inflation. So as a consequence of that, you've seen 
uh, occurs invert in emerging markets. Um, uh, and so uh, weak currencies or strong dollar uh, inverted curves, not a great environment, right? So it, it makes perfect sense why they're struggling uh, in this way. However, if you believe that inflation is uh, poised to move lower globally for the reasons that you just described, and that's a real possibility, uh, I think it's always important to keep in mind, Simon, that inflation is possibly the most difficult measure to forecast. Uh, uh, and I think that's been the lesson learned here over the mm -hmm. past few years. But if you, you actually believe that supply chain issues are starting to subside, central banks will have an effect just bringing the, the demand side of inflation lower, then I actually think the local curves in emerging markets is a, a high octane way to play that. Uh, as that's where I think one could really make a, a tremendous amount of alpha uh, in a, inflation, a disinflationary environment because these emerging market curves are, are in highly inverted. Uh, uh, and if there's any shift around central bank policy, then I think uh, they could be tremendous opportunities. So it's a little early now, I think, Simon, but we're really looking at it. And uh, I, I see it as a, a tremendous uh, opportunity here over the next 12 months. Uh, of course, which then leads us into the world of index links. You've had some big repricing in the tips market in the US, but index linkers, you know, in others, other places. Um, what, what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing and thinking? So I... I would say in the U.S., if you look at the tips market in the U.S., that is a market that um, I don't see a lot of dedicated uh, money invested in tips. Um, if I go back to 2021, a lot of retail money uh, flowed into the tips market uh, as a way to uh, insulate your portfolio from inflation, right? So, I mean, as the name implies, it's, it's inflation protected. However, it actually didn't protect your portfolio from inflation. So the time that you needed it, um, it didn't assert itself, right? So to me, that is a, uh, a telltale sign of an asset that is not a great asset to have in a, a, a broad portfolio. At the same time, the Fed was you know, in the tips market in a meaningful way. So it was, it was actually rigged to do better and it didn't do better, right? So, so, uh, so to me, I think about tips as nothing more than a relative value opportunity, not a dedicated uh, allocation. Uh, uh, but you have seen a, a, a broad repricing uh, uh, in real rates uh, globally. Uh, I think the more interesting opportunity is in the UK. So everything that's going on uh, uh, in the LDI space, um, uh, there are, there's, uh, there's been some dramatic repricings uh, in linkers. Um, uh, and, and, you know, you, it's, it's, it's eye-popping some of the price moves. Uh, so I see more opportunities uh, from an opportunistic standpoint to trade real rates and in, um, trade inflation and linkers in the UK than I do in the US as um, you're seeing fire sale type of uh, uh, asset prices um, and uh, they're opportunistically attractive to take advantage of. Okay, well, thank you. That's very good. More generally, um, I was quite surprised, although I've been, you know, investing for all these years, um, uh, by your comment that there's far less efficiency in the public fixed income markets, who, unlike their equity compatriots, um, tend to beat the index after fees regularly, and um, and so I just it was intrigued. Why do you think there is been this? Alpha that, that that the world of fixed income managers has been able to sustain is, I, I, I'm intrigued. The fixed income marketplace is a highly fragmented, highly segmented, differentiated market. And you think about the objectives of the different buyer bases. Some are yield based, some are spread based, uh, some have 
you know, peculiar uh, accounting treatments or regulatory schemes. Um, and so all these, these non-economic factors uh, drive investors' behavior. As a result of that, it's opportunistic for folks like us who can uh, go across these different channels and, and uh, play the seams. Um, so fixed income is just a, a fragmented place that provides opportunity. Um, uh, and so um, I think that's the reason behind it, Simon. I would also say that some of the index construction elements of fixed income are, are uh, somewhat uh, uh, curious. <laughs> you know, I'll use the word curious. Uh, uh, they're, uh, they're somewhat randomly designed. And so there's something like you know, 50% of the entire fixed income market that's not captured in these indices. And it's just, um, uh, 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 it, it's not for a legitimate reason per se. So it could be structured products, an area that we're uh, very much involved in uh, is largely not in these indices that are used to measure performance. 144A, which is a, a very popular mechanism of companies to, uh, issue securities, um, not part of uh, the, uh, the measuring index. So there's lots of reasons, I think, uh, underlying it, but it's ultimately the fragmentation of the marketplace that uh, allows managers such as us to take advantage and to derive alpha from it. Right. Well, just before we talk about PGM, I, I was interested in your terminology when you, and I'm going to quote you again in your most recent report, you said, after the rise in yields, balance has been restored in the asset allocation. There's a portfolio galaxy. I love the word. For, I've, never, I've never seen galaxy along with investment decisions before. Just, uh, you know, a clean sheet of paper. What are you thinking about your most important allocations here? Yeah, so I'm a Star Wars fan, so that's why, uh, <laughs> you know, it just kind of struck me as I was writing it. Um, I think the most important uh, allocation here is uh, is around duration. Uh, uh, and I talked about the balance being restored is really a comment around yields. Um, uh, and so having higher yields all else equal is better. <laughs> uh, it, it covers up a lot of uh, sins and errors. Um, as uh, just getting that income in the door is a powerful, powerful element of uh, any portfolio. So I think that's what it, the restoration of the galaxy means. Um, uh, but to me, from portfolio decisions that we're embarking on, we're really trying to be defensive, of course, given everything that I said, but take advantage of the disruption. So I mentioned uh, uh, the UK market, right? And the LDI um, deleveraging. We're seeing tremendous opportunities come out of that uh, uh, as uh, the need to uh, raise collateral and sell assets at you know, discounted prices um, is, is really quite unique, right? So. We never want to be trapped in our risk uh, uh, where uh, we can't take advantage of these things. So we're thinking of our portfolios in a, a beta negative, beta neutral way and a real focus on these idiosyncratic alpha potential opportunities. Got it. Let's just talk about a little bit about PGM and how you're organized. I see that you manage 19 of the largest sovereign wealth funds and central banks in the world and 46 of the largest 100 US pension funds, 18 of the largest European pension funds. And you're a, you know, you're a big presence. And I mean, it's staggering numbers, but you raised, have raised 160 odd billion dollars over the last three years. What are investors saying and secondly doing with you right now? I would say what's happening right now is just more questions than changes. There's been such a swift change in markets. Everything's been highly correlated that hasn't really lent itself to altering one's asset allocation scheme, right? So, you know, when all assets are moving lower at the same time, 
you you as a, a CIO is not, not induced to do something radical. So, uh, you know, we haven't seen a lot on the margin. That being said, we are seeing a lot of interest uh, um, on quasi distress, distress type of opportunities. Uh, and going back to restoring the galaxy, adding fixed income exposure given the higher level of yields. Um, uh, but we haven't seen a lot of moves as of yet. There's been more conversations, but you know, if we go back six months ago, I would say on balance, uh, investors were looking to take money out of fixed income. Uh, uh, you fast forward to today and the opposite is true. Uh, um, as uh, we are seeing more conversations, more opportunistic allocations of fixed income uh, uh, than, than uh, we, we have over the past year. So I think we're setting up really well. Uh, and what managers are looking for from folks like us at PGEM fixed income is the breadth and scale and scope. So I talked about the fragmented nature of the global marketplace. You have to have scale to take advantage of that. And so I think larger institutions in the fixed income space just naturally uh, have a competitive advantage versus more of the boutique type of places, just because it's hard to, you know, get between the, the wall and the wallpaper, so to speak, across all these different markets. So that's what I'm seeing uh, from my perch. So Greg, I've got some general closing questions for you. I'm gonna put you on the spot straight away, which is, if you were beginning your career today, you had to choose an asset class that you were going to attach yourself to, which one would it be? I would still go with fixed income. Uh, uh, and the reason why I really like fixed income is because of the diversity of it. Um, there's so much difference between the marketplaces that you feel like you're learning something new every single day. Um, and then honestly, I like the quantitative uh, and analytical aspect of it. Um, uh, and so I love the marrying of the, the macro stories with the math. And uh, I think fixed income is a, a exceptional place to play those two themes uh, in real time. Got it. Um, very different. If you could have two tickets for any sporting event in the world, what would you want to go and see and where? Oh, God, that's a great question. Uh, not the World Cup. I don't feel like uh, heading out there. I hear it's... Uh, oh, that's uh, awesome. I hear, I hear it's... I hear, I hear there's not enough hotel rooms anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, um, that's a great question. I would say I'd love to go to a Champions League final. I think that would be uh, a, a, a quite fantastic, not with Liverpool in there, uh, but, uh, you know, with another a team. I'm not sure who you support, Simon. It's not Liverpool, is it? <laughs> well, that, of course, might be exactly who I support. Oh, so I should have known. I should have known. <laughs> That's like move. the... We might move swiftly on. Um, but anyway, so Champions League. Well, look, if, if, if we happen to find you know, a couple of tickets you know, for a man as important as you, we'll have to see what we can do. Um, how do you, these are tense markets. We all have to deal with these incredible, you know, this incredible mercurialism and, and volatility. How do you get to relax? Reading. I think, uh, you know, reading, um, literature that's different from what you do every day. Um, so the way I try to approach these markets and in general is when things uh, are speeding up, you need to slow it down. Uh, you need to tune out the white noise. You need to tune out pundits and television programs that just kind of repeat the same thing over and over again. I think it puts you in uh, the wrong headspace. Uh, and put you on this frenetic path that doesn't allow you to think through the issues critically. So the way that I try to decompress uh, uh, and, and get my mind off of uh, uh, the portfolio for a little bit, and the thing about being an uh, investor is that everything happening in the world 
uh, affect your portfolio. So, you know, you can't ignore it, of course, but, you know, reading uh, 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 is something that I enjoy a lot uh, uh, and really helps me clear my head, particularly history. I think history and uh, historical biographies uh, 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 are really powerful tools as you realize very quickly that uh, um, uh, the, uh, there's always uh, a his historical perspective that informs today. And uh, um, uh, I learn a lot from it as well. Well, you have to watch this space because in December, we are hoping to have Simon Seabag Montefiore, the author who's written the history of the world through the lens of many families. And it's uh, I've, I've already had sight of it um, and it's absolutely fascinating. So we'll make sure you uh, you have a copy, a, copy, a copy of that. If you could wake up tomorrow having gained one quality or ability, what would it be? Um... Deeper introspection, I'd say. Um, I think uh, uh, you know, always trying to improve uh, your your introspection just makes you not only a better person but a better investor. Um, and kind of part and parcel to that is just a continued appreciation of humility. I think uh, 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 having humility uh, allows you to also be more introspective and think more critically as. As soon as you think you have the answers, uh, um, uh, uh, you're you're doing yourself a grave disservice. That's very true. And my final question, um, which we ask a lot of our guests after that very good book, if you could tell us just one thing about, about what, life, love, and about any happen. advice, any advice for life. Well, so my advice to life is. I, I mean, who the heck would listen to me for advice to life? But, but it's, um, but you know, the advice that I give to to people in this industry, uh, uh, which I think is general advice, which is you know tune out, you know tune out the white noise, right? Um, um, uh, and so I think we're too tied up into uh, kind of repetitive narratives uh, and talking heads and alike. Um, uh, and I don't think it allows you to think critically. So uh, my advice is, you know, when things go, uh, you know, it's going on hyperspeed, you need to slow it down. Uh, uh, you need to slow down your thought process, tune out the white noise and focus on what really matters. And that's not only for life, but for your portfolio and business as well. Correct. Well, Greg, we've had nearly 100 interviews. This is our first interview on fixed income, which probably reflects the world that we've been unenthusiastic about. But I'm taking two specific conclusions away. I'm going to quote you the restoration of the galaxy because there's yield and therefore there are policy options. So as allocators have things that they can think about, they can act upon, and there's some particular dislocations creating some very specific opportunities that folks like you have been looking at. And really good advice for business and personal, which is when everything speeds up, you need to slow down. And I can definitely learn from that. So, Greg, it's been terrific having this conversation today. And so thank you so much for coming on the show. No, thank you, Simon. This has been uh, uh, really difficult. You, uh, very hard <laughs> questions. You are uh, forcing me to think about things in a very deep way. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. <laughs>